I'd like to talk about crossing this gap between what we think in medicine and what we know. Quite often, what we do in medicine is what our teacher before had happened to him or her. And it becomes legend in the way we do things, but it may not be true. So imagine you're not feeling too well. You've been sick for weeks, not terribly ill. You go to see your doctor. She does a bunch of tests. You have no idea what's wrong with you. She doesn't either. So finally, after weeks, he says, come into my back room. I have a machine. I'll use it to make a diagnosis. And I can use it to determine your treatment. You're desperate. You've been sick. Why not? You go in the back room. This is the machine. <laughs> Would you leave? So much of what we do reflects just the play of chance. How did we get beyond the play of chance to knowing what was at least highly likely to be true rather than simply where the ball fell? The answer will tell by going back to one of the scourges of mankind, tuberculosis. Uh, so this man is uh, uh, James Burns Amberson. He was born in Northwest Ohio, went to medical school at Johns Hopkins, and graduated in uh, 1929, pardon me, 1919, with tuberculosis and an MD degree. So instead of going to do an internship at a general hospital, he went to the Loomis Sanitarium uh, outside of New York. He was there nine years. He gets married there, he has kids, he joins the staff. It's like the Israeli model. Uh, he's treated with uh, Santa Croissant, a uh, sodium gold thiosulfate treatment uh, that had been developed by Molgard in Denmark. Molgard had studied it in vitro and in guinea pigs, and it seemed to be effective against Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Amberson was convinced it almost killed him and that he survived despite of the treatment rather than because of the treatment. So they finally kicked him out of the uh, sanitarium. They said, okay, Amberson, you know, you're, you're done. So what do you do? It's been nine years since you graduated from medical school. You get a job in another tuberculosis sanitarium. And fortunately, at that time, there were lots of jobs like that. There were lots of TB sanitary everywhere. So he goes to the Spring Hill Sanitarium, uh, just outside of Detroit, Michigan, and he wants to see, wants to test this drug, Santa Uh Here we see him. This uh, shows you the use, utility of these faculty pictures. Uh, Amberson's the third from your left, uh, there with his hands in his pocket. Uh, he wants to test whether Santa Croissant really worked in tuberculosis. So he does something that nobody else had done before. He publishes this article about the study, but it was a clinical trial of Santa Croissant in tuberculosis. What he did was he put together two groups of patients, 12 in each group, that were perfectly matched, as far as he could tell, by clinical characteristics. And then, he did something that nobody else had done before. The first one, he flipped a coin to decide which of those two groups was going to be the control group and which was going to be the active treatment group. Before, people knew in advance as they were assigning, you're in the control group, you're in the active treatment group, you look a little better than the average, I'm gonna put you in the active treatment group, you don't look so happy, I'm gonna put you in the control group. Sub, you know, this wasn't, Active thinking, this was subliminal bias. He eliminated that bias by using the coin flip to make the assignment. Here are his data, hard to see. Here's the summary of his data. Uh, this is how data were back in the early 1930s. So the top is Santa Croix and the bottom are the uh, controls. Uh, slightly improved to the far left, much improved, unchanged. Sort of not the way we would do it today, we would switch them around. Slightly worse, much worse, and fatal. You can see that with Santa Croissant, one person dies, four are much worse. 
they stop using it. It's actually abandoned from use after this paper is published. So something that had been in standard use because it should have worked, it worked in vitro, it worked in guinea pigs, it should work in humans, it turns out it didn't. They did the test, they showed it didn't work, it was off the market. This was a big step forward. It took us a while before we actually had something to work. This is Selman Waxman. When I present in the United States, I like to say, a Hungarian immigrant comes to the United States, a soil microbiologist, right? Studying streptomyces, an extract from streptomyces called streptomycin. And he shows in vitro that it prevents the growth of uh, tuberculosis and in guinea pigs, but he wants to study this in people. And so as you are organizing here in Rambam, he works with a drug company. He partners with Merck. Merck is able to produce kilograms of streptomycin at clinical grade so it can be used in clinical trials. Now the first 100 kilograms or so uh, goes to the British Medical Council for the study. Selman Waxman wins the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology, 1952. Now, this is an editor's forum, so I'm going to give you a little opinion. Um, in 1951, in the British Medical Journal, Selman Waxman wrote a review article on the drug treatment of tuberculosis. He was the world's expert on this. In 2017, he couldn't do that because the editors of the British Medical Journal have said he took money from a drug company, he therefore has been spoiled for life. Now, I argue that we should try to find the best person and then use our job as editors to make sure that if there's bias in what he or she writes, that we try to remove or minimize that bias, but finding an expert should not be prejudiced about trying to take a treatment from the lab to people. A treatment that arguably changed the entire landscape of tuberculosis. This is the article in the British Medical Journal that resulted from that 200 kilograms. That was back when the BMJ was a respectable journal. Uh, and <laughs> you can see from this on the right that it's a very difficult data display. Above the line is an improvement. Below the line is getting worse. Uh, the data are stratified by temperature. You can see that in each temperature stratum, people on the S, the streptomycin, did better than the C control patients. Uh, there isn't a p-value in this entire article, um, even though Bradford Hill, the statistician that came up with the way this was the first time that people were randomized in space and time. Right? In the Burns-Amberson experiment, he had everybody in a room. He said, this is group A, this is group B. I could flip a coin. But when you're randomizing people at many sites over many days, how do you maintain that randomization? That was a problem that Bradford Hill solved, and he was uh, one of the key authors on this work. So in the setting of turning what we think into what we know, the randomized controlled trial becomes our brick in the wall that we're building, or the house that we're building. And this just shows you a bunch of randomized controlled trials. To me, the big step came um, when President Kennedy signs the Kefauver-Harris drug amendments in the US. This gives the US FDA the statutory power to require high quality scientific evidence before a drug could be approved for sale. Before that time, they didn't have that power. Now in this image, uh, there's one woman. Anybody know who that woman is? It's Frances Kelsey. Does that help? She was the reviewer at the FDA that kept thalidomide off the market in the US, single-handedly, because she said the scientific evidence isn't there. And it's representative of what the FDA stood for, high quality science. You have to show me. You have to prove what you have works. Now, with the clinical trial, we did clinical trials, and some of these are in the Lancet. Uh, you can see we were using clinical trials as a way of changing medical practice. It turned what we thought into what we knew, a very powerful tool. So with any powerful tool, 
you can have a problem, right? You have a lot of data. Anybody who's ever done a clinical trial knows you never publish all your data. Some of the data make no sense at all. I've done a clinical trial. We had a couple of people in that trial who were over a century old. I knew that was probably inappropriate. There was a mistake. They came in at visits and had blood pressures of zero. Doesn't happen. So the data need to be cleaned. That's appropriate. But sometimes you can either selectively ignore what you want or selectively enhance the outcomes. And the poster child for this was so-called study 329. This was a study sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline. It was looking at adolescents with major depression, giving paroxetine, uh, sold as Paxil. And in this study, in the clinical trial, they measured major depression six different ways. When they measured it six different ways, one of those ways showed a slight positive effect toward paroxetine. This paper shows that result. It doesn't tell you about the ways it doesn't, didn't work. If you read it very carefully, you could understand that it was measured by more than one way. But the most readers got the message this stuff worked when it really didn't. So there was a FDA advisory council uh, to look to see if uh, F, uh, GSK could get a label change for uh, paroxetine. And it turns out that it couldn't. And Elliot Spitzer, who was the attorney general of New York, sues GSK for fraud. And the basis of the fraud was, you're advertising this stuff works when you know that in five out of six tests it didn't. And the state of New York had bought this drug and that was fraudulent. You should have not been able to do that. So this is June of uh, 2004. You can see me, I have a bow tie on. I'm fourth from the left, I had more hair. Uh, as it happens. Uh, all the editors, uh, we were meeting in Croatia, all the editors had had this experience that we'd had a chance to look at an article where the authors had changed the outcome after the study was done. The classic example was you'd have a study in breast cancer that had been powered for all-cause mortality. When they looked at the data, it turned out the only positive result was for breast-specific uh, mortality. So the paper comes to you as a breast-specific mortality paper, not an all-cause mortality paper. You publish it, not really knowing what's going on. Um, we'd all had this experience. <laughs> the fences had been moved after the ball was hit. It's, if, even for people who understand baseball, it's pretty clear. Right. So you needed to know what the plan was before it started. For those of you who play billiards, you say, I'm going to put the eight ball in the side pocket before you shoot. And the medical editors said, we got together as a cartel and said that if you don't register your trial at the time the first patient's enrolled, we're not interested in it. And when we said that, there was tremendous pushback from the research community. We heard from the drug companies that they would put them out of business. Their research projects were a secret. We heard from academics. The little guys, the guys here at Rambam, were going to be shut out by those big guys in Tel Aviv. They had that machine that could turn out that research project before they could even get started. We couldn't make this public. We editors held their ground on that one. And uh, it succeeded uh, with clinical trials registration requirement. We wrote in uh, 2004 for a deadline of 2005. So this is an image showing the number of registered studies on the vertical axis and the year on the horizontal axis. Uh, this right here uh, is uh, 2005 where the arrow is, is the day we said the trials have to be registered. Now, as an editor, I can tell you that a time series is the least compelling data you can gather because there can be ecological changes. But I argue that it was likely causal because of what the editor said to have this uptick in registration that occurred at exactly that same week. And now, in 2017, registering a clinical trial involving human beings is standard practice. 
No one's going out of business. It's common. It's how we do business. We change the landscape on that one. So in 2008, the younger Mr. Bush uh, solved, signed in the U.S. the FDA Amendments Act, the final rule. That was in 2008. In 2016 and early 2017, we finally had a set of recommendations. So the key message here is that it took nine years for the community to agree on the reporting of aggregate results, not individual patients. So you have a trial that's been registered in clinicaltrials.gov. What the new rule says that if you do business in the United States or get grants from the United States government, one year after last patient last visit, you have to put in clinicaltrials.gov the aggregate results of your trial. A table showing who was in the trial, your key primary and secondary outcomes, and an adverse event table. The editors got together and said, that is not publication. It won't preclude publication. And with that, um, this has become a rule, um, but you can see how long this took. And the compliance with this is still not terrific. Uh, compliance is at best 30 to 40 percent, slightly better among uh, industry-sponsored trials in the NIH, although the NIH is sort of caught up. Uh, and this is the registration and the availability of aggregate trial results. So as we move forward, the last thing is individual patient data. This is something that's in the future. This is a log order, 10 times more complicated, at least, than aggregate results reporting. But I believe it's where we need to go. Now in 2015, pardon me, 2013, the National uh, Academy of Medicine, then known as the Institute of Medicine, put together a panel on reporting of in, and sharing of individual patient data. I served on that panel. I was a clinical trialist. I went in thinking this was not a great idea. I came out 15 months later convinced that yeah, although it might be hard, it was the right thing to do. And I was convinced because patients had put themselves at risk. When you're in a clinical trial, you're taking a chance. You're leaving some aspect of your care to the play of chance so that play of chance can clarify what we know. It is an important activity and one that we need to encourage. And when we heard from patients over and over again, they told us they wanted their data to be widely shared, but responsibly shared. And now we've tried to figure out, how do we walk that line between wide and responsible? And that's the story of individual patient data sharing. I'd like to sort of tell you how I see it. On the left, we see the potential benefits. And I've just told you about the moral obligation to patients who put themselves at risk. To me, this overrides everything else, but I'm a practical person. I'm an engineer and a physicist. Things need to actually work. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we think that this will increase public trust. If your data are out there for other people to analyze and they're able to replicate your results, that will increase public trust. The people who are against data sharing have said that patients' data may in fact get into the public domain when it shouldn't. Maybe it's not so bad in a trial of hypertension, but suppose you enrolled in a trial of a sexually transmitted disease or of schizophrenia or something with a social stigma. And there were people who were out to get you. You've just decided to run for public office and someone goes through the records and discovered uh, that you uh, had were in a clinical trial for schizophrenia. I won't say anything about our current administration. Uh, and how would you feel? It had been uncovered. So there's this risk to privacy. And yesterday we heard about a way to overcome this risk. Don't know if it would actually work, but it sounds like it's a pretty good idea. And it could erode the public trust because people who want to use the data for nefarious purposes could do it. They could reanalyze your data. You said, look, it's really important. The sun rises in the east. And they said, no, no, if you analyze the data my way, it shows the sun rises in the north. 
and then you've started a fight, you've decreased public trust, How, who have you helped? And so people have said, what problem are you trying to solve when you make the data available? And to me, the answer is simple. We're increasing the trust of people who volunteer to be in clinical trials. No one volunteers to be in a clinical trial to be the, um, have their data used only by the people who they work with. They want their data, as far as I can tell, to be widely but responsibly used. So again, we go back, widely and responsibly. How do we fix that? So while the academics have been arguing, the industry people have pretty much gone ahead of us. Uh, they made access to patient level data possible a few years ago. Now this is GSK, these are the people who brought us study 329, the paroxetine study. Now some people said they did this because the government forced them to do it, but the people at GSK and the government say that wasn't the case. I know both uh, Nissen and Rockhold, I think they did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. In 2013, they put on a public website individual patient data. But you couldn't just go download it and put it on your laptop. First, you had to go to a group and get permission to access the data. Second, you didn't get the data. You got permission to access the data. So you could query the data on their website using standard statistical packages. You'd send them the query. They'd run, after you were approved, they'd send them the query. They'd run it. They'd give you the answer. Anybody that's done this knows it's not the best way. It's easier to have the data so you can kind of play with it, in quotes. But this protects privacy because if you don't have access to the patient data, you can't do the queries that would be needed to identify people. This is the way they did it. They provided data in 2013. In 2014, they launched a public website with the name of clinicalstudydatarequest.com. Um, in 2015, the Wellcome Trust took over the shepherding of those decisions who had access to the data. So it was taken, given by GSK to the Wellcome Trust as an independent third party. In 10 drug companies, with, had over 1,200 studies on that site. It's easy to get on. If you want to stop listening to me, you can go to CSDR, clinicalstudydatarequest.com, get a username and password, get an application, and before dinner tonight, you can submit an application you'll hear in a, two weeks' time if you have an idea of what you want to do with the data. The problem is the data are on their platform and they're from many different companies. And so if you want to align data from half a dozen companies, it's really hard because every data set has its own taxonomy. And that's been the problem. So it's sort of available but not really useful or easily useful. And the question's been asked, is the juice worth the squeeze? Or how does it feel to be an orange? Um, here in Israel, so uh, there are data from 1,200 trials available, 177 research proposals. There have been three manuscripts. Is this worth it? This has cost over, for the period of time it's been out there, many millions of dollars. So I argue that simply having the data available, even if no one's using it, increases the public trust. You can sort of see it there. It makes a positive difference. So that's where we stand now. Here's what we have. We have the NIH, the Wellcome Trust, the Cancer Research UK, Doris Duke, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. All of these, save the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, say they require data sharing. But they've set it as an aspirational thing, something they aspire to. Only the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have laid down the rules, and that's because they have the money to create the database to require the data be deposited in their database when articles are published. So with aspirations, uh, how do you get to reality? So what's this? It's not really a terribly hard thing. This is... It's an impressionistic painting of a train, right? It's like, I want to share data. It's an idea. But if you get close and look at it, it no longer looks like a train. In fact, it could be a frog or something else, right? You don't really know. If you want a train, you need one of these. You need an engineering drawing. So you know, bring out the really uh, 
uh, engineer in me. If you want an engine, you need an engineering drawing. And you can get one. So in 2015, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors made a proposal to the world. This was our engineering drawing. We said, when an article is published, the uh, primary outcome, the data outlying the secondary outcome, and the adverse event database had to be made public at six months. We put that out there for comment. We got a lot of comments. A third of the people said, this is a terrific idea, but making me wait six months, it's unconscionable. That's terrible. It should happen right away. A third of the people said, six months sounds pretty good. This isn't all the data, but it's a large fraction of it. I like it. A third of the people said, are you kidding? Six months? It should be six years. I've spent six years of my life gathering these data. I don't want to give them away. Why should anybody do clinical research? How would you feel if somebody went into your lab and stole your notebooks right after you'd published your paper? You'd call the police. That was the response of many clinical investigators. So you can see that we had a variety of opinions. So back to my railroad analogy, we had a train. It was going on the tracks. We presented our um, ideas. We'd run out of track because we had an idea, but it was too hard to bring to fruition, right? We had a train that wanted to go somewhere. We still had work to do. We had more track to lay. So last night, uh, we published an editorial which was the results of going back to the drawing board. And this is the proposal now of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. When an article is published, you need to put in a public data sharing statement. We're not going to require to tell you what the statement says. You just need to tell us, when you publish an article, who can have the data, what data are available, when they'll be available, for what reason, that how you want to use them, and by what means. And here are some examples of acceptable public data sharing statements. On the far left, we have full open access. You can say that when our article is published, anyone can have access to all the data immediately for any purpose and it's in the public domain. This is not a dream. The um, clinical trials network from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, a trial actually had some origins here in Israel of treating patients with uh, little children with potential peanut allergy, giving them bomba when they were growing up, prevented peanut allergy. I mean, it's a tremendous advance, but those data were available, the entire data set was available the moment we published the paper on a public website. So this isn't a dream, it actually happens, and no bad has come from it. In fact, uh, one of our statistical analysis uh, consultants uses the data to teach his first year students at Harvard. On my far right is that I'm not gonna give my data to anybody for any reason at any time. Now, I think here in 2017, if somebody said they started the trial 10 years ago and this is their data sharing policy, we'd say, okay, you can be your data sharing policy. I don't think the public will put up with it. I think we're just going to shame people into it. You can't do this now. You can. I mean, I think from a journal editor's perspective, this would be what you had said you were going to do 10 years ago. But is it viable now? I think most things are going to be in the control of access where you say what data you have available, to whom, for what reason. Just tell us what you're doing. All we're asking for is a data sharing statement. Now, as a journal editor, we're going to pe the people who want the data. They don't get it free either. What data do you want? Why? By what means? What do you want to do with it? That needs to be out there also. Um, the data will be in data warehouses, some of which exist, some of which are under construction, but a key aspect of a data a a warehouse is a front office. And the front office adjudicates the claims between the people who want the data and the people providing it, the data, and that's open to the public. It's a game played out for everyone to see. And you can see that I told you about the NIH trial share, that's the big blue, that's the one that currently exists, but some of these are actually existing, some of them are ideas that are coming to fruition, but they're going to be lots of data warehouses. They don't exist yet. So we really couldn't require data sharing, and we'd have to work out the privacy issue. So it's on the way, it's aspirational. 
I want to thank these people who helped me put the talk together. But most of all, I want to thank you. People who do clinical trials, participate in clinical trials. You turn what we think into what we know. And as a medical editor, I want to have your data out so other people can use it. We want to reward your sacrifice. We want to help advance medicine. So when I stand at a bedside, and I still do that, I can look at a patient in the eye and I can say, we know this is likely to work rather than I hope it's going to work. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>